innovation, disruption, and big issues. This is Business Game Changers with Sarah Westall. Welcome to Business Game Changers. I'm Sarah Westall. This is the final episode of the Wayne Jet series on the Great Depression, what you did not learn in school. But keep an eye out for the next episode that I do with Wayne Jett. We're going to dive into the Elite Manifesto that H.G. Wells wrote and really look at what that said and how does it relate to what's going on in the world. Very few people have researched it as much as Wayne Jett, and so he's an expert on what the manuscript was and how it relates to history. So I'm bringing him back to do that. So keep an eye out for that. That'll come out in a couple weeks. So let's get to the final episode of the Great Depression, What You Did Not Learn in School. Well, a 400% increase in a sh- in 18 months is absolutely astronomical inflation. Uh-huh. So how did that affect the rest of the economy? Well, of course, uh, uh, it caused the oil price uh, to quadruple uh, and the price of gasoline to quadruple. And of course, history indicates that we actually went over to the Saudis and suggested that they uh, uh, create their uh, OPEC cartel and that, uh, that they quadruple the price of oil. So they would, obviously they were saying, we want the same amount of gold we've been getting in the past uh, for our oil. And uh, Kissinger told them, uh, "At a boy, uh, we're right with you." And they did that. Uh, they did it supposedly through OPEC and supposedly d- despite our protests. But it was it was a deal, and uh, and obviously it would be because uh, when you're inflating the money away, the guys who are who know that you're inflating it are not going to go along with you and continue selling the product uh, when what they're getting from you is uh, going to become worth much less uh, as each year goes on. Um, uh, uh, the big players were able to protect themselves to some extent, uh, but uh, not the ordinary person. And uh, uh, we can go on. Uh, I'd like to go on at this point from uh, to uh, – you know just how it uh, you know, came about. Uh, the price of uh, oil and the price of uh, gold kept going up in the 70s, but as of uh, as of 1979, it was still in the on the order of uh, $250 or below per ounce. Uh, but it was starting to rise again. Uh, it had fluctuated back and forth, you know, around $200, and that's still well up from 145 and certainly well up from uh, 35 at the beginning of the decade. Uh, but we're in 1979, and uh, uh, there's starting to be concerns in the Carter administration about further inflation getting worse. And so uh, a new head of the Fed was appointed, Paul Volcker. Now, let me tell you who Paul Volcker was, and is, for that matter. Um, Paul Volcker was uh, the number two guy in Treasury. Uh, Well, uh, before that, he was from the Rockefeller Banks. He was a Rockefeller banker from Chase, Manhattan. He was there before, and he was there... uh, uh, more than once and after he uh, uh, left office. But uh, nevertheless, uh, he was uh, basically a financial man from uh, the Rockefeller banks, uh, which is another way of saying somewhat uh, the Rothschild banks. But um, he was the number two guy at uh, uh, the announcement August 15th of 71. Uh, when we went off the gold standard, when we closed the gold windows, he was the architect of that, along with the Treasury Secretary, uh, John Connolly. Uh, Volcker was the so-called uh, number two guy, the one with the real monetary ties to get that job done. So he was a part of the, of the uh, inflationary act that they did, very much a part of it. But he was made Fed chairman in 1979. And uh, although supposedly it was to fight inflation, 
uh, what it really was, I think, uh, at least uh, initially, was to elect Jimmy Carter uh, to a second term. And so uh, whether that was or was not the intention, uh, he promptly announced that he was going to uh, change the way the Fed determined uh, how it managed money and how its uh, methods were going to be designed. Uh, he adopted Milton Friedman's approach to uh, uh, monetary uh, policy, and that was uh, you control inflation by controlling the amount of dollars that you uh, create. Uh, you don't do it by controlling interest rates. And so he he let he cut the interest rate that the Fed had been controlling loose and let the market determine it. And he decided he would just monitor how much money he's putting into the economy uh, to uh, allow it to grow, but not to inflate. So he started that in the fall of 1979. And uh, by doing that, he, he took uh, the blame off himself for letting interest rates rise, said the market's going to do that. And uh, in order, I guess, to improve uh, Carter's chances, he decided to put quite a bit of money into the economy. He put so much in that the price of gold uh, blew through the roof uh, by 1980, hmm. just uh, you know before the election. It went from $250 uh, or less in uh, 1979 to a high spiked up of $892 an ounce in uh, 1980 before the election. And of course, as that was happening, interest rates were way double digit. Uh, we're talking about big time interest rates that kill the economy. You mentioned that Milton Friedman's theory was involved in this. Yes. Is, was he involved in this process as well? Uh, yes, he was. Uh, he was advising uh, 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 Volcker as Fed chairman, and uh, I'm sure they were going back and forth about it. I don't know. Uh, uh, certainly, I didn't have direct knowledge about that, but I do have a story about it. As to what happened on the downside of that, uh, Reagan was elected, of course, in 1980s election. Uh, Carter turned out uh, with uh, the economy in uh, terrible condition, very high interest rates, uh, real estate uh, uh, failing and on its back because of uh, cost of development and all all sorts of problems of that kind. Uh, and the oil price, of course, with that inflation had gone to, uh, I believe, the high at that time. It was in the $50 a barrel range. And so uh, that was a very high price for oil. And uh, uh, Volcker then, uh, even in 1980, maybe his intention was to, to get Carter out of office. I can't really tell you that. Uh, but... Uh, at least initially, it looked to me as if he uh, decided, even before the election, that uh, the election was lost for Carter, and he started pulling money out of the economy, out of the monetary base. The way he did that is he sells bonds. Uh, in order to create the money, he had, he had created dollars and bought U.S. Treasury bonds with them, and now he just sold some of those bonds into the market and started sucking dollars out of the monetary base. That's the way you do it. That's the way he did it. And he did that with a vengeance, and he did it so uh, drastically that that $892 uh, started dropping like a rock in terms of the price of gold. Um, and uh, at that time, the man I've mentioned to you uh, more than once before that I, I later began working with, uh, much later, uh, after the year 2000, uh, told me that uh, he uh, contacted he contacted Volker uh, on St. Patrick's Day of uh, 
trying to remember which date uh, of which year. I think it was uh, 82. Uh, it might have been 81, but Volcker was drawing so much money out that the price of gold was dropping towards $300 an ounce. And uh, Jude Winiski had, uh, in his analysis, had calculated that if it drops below $300 an ounce, there will be a financial crisis, banks will fail, and uh, we'll have a real problem on our hands. And uh, he called and spoke with Volcker and told him that, and Volcker's response was, uh, Milton thinks that if we uh, uh, add any funds at this point, uh, that it will cause a, a spike in interest rates and uh, bonds will uh, crash. And so we're not going to do it. And so uh, uh, he he kept uh, his own course. Uh, we dropped a little below $300 an ounce. And uh, Mexico announced a default on its bank loans. Uh, the big banks immediately went to Volcker and said, you got to bail out Mexico. Uh, so Volcker changed course, uh, bailed out the Mexican banks. The gold price went back above uh, 300 and we got some stability. Uh, he stopped the uh, severity of the thing. And right at that point, uh, the uh, Reagan tax cuts uh, had had uh, come into play and started growing and needed more money. And so then the Reagan recovery was uh, off and running and uh, that crisis uh, was averted. Uh, but that's, that's the, basically my uh, look at uh, what was going on in that period of time. Now, in that vein, I want to jump to uh, provide the bridge between there and uh, the tech crash, certainly. Okay, go ahead. Certainly, the Fed was was involved in what happened with the Reagan thing, just as I described. Well, by 1987, the Reagan boom uh, was uh, was still on, uh, but uh, Volcker left the scene, and Alan Greenspan. There had been some talk, by the way, under the Reagan administration of going back to the gold standard and providing a steady value for the dollar, uh, but it, it never came to pass. Um, there were some you know, international discussions, but uh, no deal. And uh, uh, so we get to 87, Volcker uh, leaves the bank, leaves the Fed, and uh, Alan Greenspan is his replacement. Well, he doesn't even have the chair warm uh, and Greenspan makes a comment that uh, uh, the value of the dollar really doesn't worry him, something to that sort, in an interview with Fortune magazine. And uh, immediately, that's on a Friday uh, after market, and immediately on Sunday we have a major crash, the 87 crash of the stock market. Uh, when uh, by evidence... Uh, in my mind, uh, there was a large sale of equities uh, from the U.S. markets by foreign investors, thinking that uh, a further inflation of the dollar was going to uh, kill the economy and kill their investment in terms of the value in their currencies. And so, therefore, uh, we had that crash. Uh, Greenspan corrected his comments, I guess, gave some reassurances that no, he wasn't going to inflate the dollar. And uh, that crash was immediately ended and reversed. Uh, and uh, so we went to a period of time between uh, 87, 88 and uh, 96 in which uh, in which Greenspan managed the dollar very carefully uh, and the monetary uh, quantities in, in such a way. Uh, actually, uh, even Volcker had abandoned the money quantities uh, approach and had gone back to so-called managing by interest rates. 
setting the uh, overnight funds rate again. And so Greenspan continued that and basically managed uh, the price of the dollar according to the price of gold, uh, keeping the price of gold in the range of about $400 an ounce. Uh, sometimes a little more, 420, something of that sort. But that was where we were as of uh, uh, 96. Uh, there was a noticeable change at that point, and the price of gold uh, started declining. Uh, so much so that uh, by 97, uh, my later colleague, uh, Jude Winiski, noticed that the price of gold uh, was falling, and uh, he contacted Greenspan, with whom he had had regular communications, uh, and told him uh, that uh, he, he told him this by uh, communication, not in person, but I offered to come over and meet with him. Uh, he was saying, we're going to have deflation. If you don't keep the gold price up, you're not putting in enough money. Uh, Greenspan never answered him. Uh, Winiski became so concerned about it that he gave up on repeated uh, contacts of Greenspan and he contacted the White House directly. That would be the Clinton White House. The Clinton White House referred him to the Treasury Department, uh, where by that time um, Larry Summers uh, was the Treasury Secretary. And uh, uh, Summers met with him. He, actually, uh, he might have been the deputy, the number two guy there, but uh, 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 Winiski went and met uh, with uh, Summers and told him his concerns that uh, if you don't keep the gold price up by issuing more dollars, this is a clear sign of deflation. The, value, the dollar is getting too valuable. Uh, you're going to have a collapse of the economy uh, because of uh, uh, the deflation you're causing, uh, the prices ha having to be cut. And so... Uh, Summer's response was, in short, uh, uh, we don't do gold. We don't pay attention to that. And uh, we're doing just fine. So uh, thanks for your concern. And that was that. Well, they kept on the same thing. Uh, gold kept declining in price. It was a clear sign of deflation. Uh, gold dropped to a low of $252 an ounce. And it dropped because of what the Federal Reserve is doing. Yes. and uh, Because gold is continually manipulated. Uh, well, uh, it's not that uh, gold at that time was not being manipulated. Uh, it was simply reflecting a market price, which was a market price at that time. It's no longer a market price, but it was then. W when did that change? Although I don't want to get off your topic right now, but when do you think was a point that gold stopped reflecting the market? Uh, it wasn't until the uh, – uh, generally, I'll, I'll just call it the 2008 crash period. Okay, because uh, now it's way out thereafter. of whack. It is uh, way out of whack now, but – and very manipulated, uh, but we'll get to that later. Um, where we were in uh, in the late 90s, the Fed was deliberately creating a circumstance of deflation for a purpose. And it was uh, very much connected with the tech crash of 2000. Uh, but before that, it had already collapsed the economies of what was then called uh, the tigers of Southeast Asia. Uh, the nations, uh, including Japan, that were uh, really very productive, very prosperous. They were very growing. They had been borrowing U.S. dollars to grow their economy and to participate in international trade. 
and were doing very well, but the deflated dollar killed them because they were having to pay back their uh, borrowed dollars with dollars that were almost 50% more valuable than when they borrowed them. And Was that our point? Uh, it was, but it also was to make a killing in the U.S. economy. And I'll describe to you exactly how that happened. Just as it happened in the, uh, in the Asian tigers, this more valuable dollar, and it's, ha it's been happening uh, uh, with many countries uh, otherwise more recently, but let's, let's stay on this 1990s area. I'll, I'll, I'm talking to myself here. Uh, in those late 1990s, as I said, I believe, uh, oil fell to $10 a barrel. People don't remember that uh, after going to uh, the heights that it did um, in uh, uh, the later inflation, uh, but but it felt actually back to ten dollars a barrel uh, in nineteen ninety eight ninety nine that period, uh, and uh, that is a reflection of what had also uh, occurred in other industries of the U.S in the types of industries that price their goods on the basis of like commodity prices, whether it's sand and gravel or cement or uh, uh, gasoline or things of that nature, all of those things are spot market priced on a daily basis depending upon what the market is. And when the market collapses for that, the price collapses. and as those commodity price industries, the basic industries, uh, lost their profitability because their prices were falling, uh, people moved out of their stocks. Investors moved their money out of their stocks. They sold their stocks. The stocks went way down in price, and they put, they invested their investing funds in the only thing that looked like it was still growing really fast, high tech. But they, they, they took that to such an extent, there were no other good investments to make. They put all of the capital into high tech, and high tech went through the roof far higher than it uh, warranted. And then, of course, in March of uh, the year 2000, it had become apparent that uh, when all the other industries were on their back, High tech has no customers, and so all of a sudden that vulnerability of high tech uh, was recognized, and uh, uh, the crash started for 2000. So that crash was most definitely set up by the deflationary years that the Federal Reserve knowingly created, and you can bet that the insiders of the Fed uh, knew exactly what was happening. And that gets spread through the big banks. It gets spread through the hedge funds. All of this supposedly very confidential, of course, but it's not. And so uh, uh, what do we come to? Well, uh, we come to the beginning of the crash. Uh, uh, about the first week of March of uh, 2000. Now, I've got a, another aspect of this story that's very important to consider that I didn't learn until later. Okay. Uh, certainly didn't know about it at the time. But uh, in the year 2007, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, settled a case against Goldman Sachs. It announced in uh, March of 2007 that it was settling a case involving misconduct by uh, Goldman Sachs in failing to supervise those with access to its trading platforms. And uh, as a result of this uh, failure on Goldman Sachs' part, this settlement announcement said that uh, we have uh, imposed a fine and Goldman Sachs has agreed to a fine. Uh, 
uh, of $7 million uh, for its failure to supervise those with access to its trading platforms uh, for a period, and it generally described the period. I watched those words very carefully, and I calculated what period they covered, and they covered basically uh, the closest uh, estimate I could come from the 1st of March of 2000 until October of 2002. Uh, that just happened to be uh, the exact limits of the beginning and the end of the tech crash of 2000-2002. Now what was this failure of supervision? It happens that in March of uh, 2000, Goldman Sachs had authorized its hedge fund clients, its major trading clients, to have direct access to the trading pla platforms. They didn't have to go through Goldman Sachs employees. And those trading uh, partners, hedge funds, with access to the trading platforms, immediately began a practice of conducting short trades but calling them long trades on their trading slips. Uh, that is, they were selling stock that they didn't own uh, and uh, in my estimation that they didn't deliver because they wouldn't borrow uh, shares to deliver on a long trade. They were calling them long trades when they were not, but essentially they were selling short and they were selling naked short. Uh, that is, selling shares that were counterfeit or fake shares that they didn't own and they were dropping them into the market on a very important basis. By marking them as long sales, they didn't have to obey what's called the uptick rule that was in effect at that time. The uptick rule says you can't sell short unless the previous sale before yours was an uptick in the market price. That was an inhibition against just uh, uh, rampant counterfeiting of stock and selling short uh, on an unending basis in order to knock prices down. Okay, so let's describe exactly what we had. At the outset and throughout the tech crash of 2000-2002, there was a practice ongoing in Goldman Sachs in which its hedge funds were selling short, marking long, violating the uptick rule, and dumping uh, so many millions of shares on the market that the prices were absolutely devastated. Uh, that produces a crash uh, in market uh, prices, uh, much like it did in the, the uh, crash of 29, but this time, of course, on steroids uh, with the help of computers and all that. Now, um, in my estimation, my opinion, um, that is probably the largest case of violation of the securities laws and uh, qualifying as trading fraud, in my estimation, in the history of the SEC. And yet, during the time of the SEC's investigation, which would have uh, been through 2006 until the settlement in 2007. The CEO of Goldman Sachs during that entire tech crash was a man who was in 2006 nominated for Treasury Secretary and Economic Czar by President George W. Bush and approved, uh, endorsed by both parties, uh, Charles Schumer, the uh, senior senator from New York, immediately endorsed the nomination as the most qualified person we could find uh, that uh, is possible to be appointed. He came in there uh, 
after selling uh, practically a billion dollars worth of uh, investment in Goldman Sachs, uh, ownership interest in Goldman Sachs, and he did that uh, in order to come down there for a year and a half or so, maybe it was two and a half years, and uh, and during his nomination and confirmation as Treasury Secretary, and uh, without doubt the one given power over economic policy, there was not a single mention made of this pending case of the SEC, um, or uh, what I believe it must have been the largest case in SEC history. Uh, but. Uh, they got but they didn't have to admit guilt, and they only paid a $7 million fine. That's correct. Uh, and if SEC, uh, I mean, if Goldman Sachs were doing that, uh, I feel quite certain that uh, other uh, big uh, firms were doing it as well. Uh, that uh, doesn't leave much in the way of, uh, we'll say, fair market practices in U.S. markets, in my estimation. Uh, so uh, that is um, a, a quick analysis or, or uh, summary of uh, the way the tech crash uh, came to be. One other thing that you mentioned that is worth noting is that Paulson sold nearly $1 billion in Goldman Sachs stock when he took the job because apparently he had to conflict of interest, but he didn't have to pay any taxes on that. I, I think there was a provision that for such appointments you get to have uh, uh, these uh, uh, disposition of assets uh, on a tax-free basis. I'd have to go back and research that again further. Uh, re uh, I report on the, uh, the point in my book, but uh, I haven't refreshed my mind to be absolutely certain whether he finally has to pay the taxes later or what. But my recollection is that's no taxes. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, wait, wait till we get to 2008. <laughs> yeah, we'll build into that I'm, because it gets uh, worse. I'm convinced that he came there uh, to be the quarterback for what uh, we were going to experience in 2008. Um, and so uh, if you're ready, we might as well get at that. Yeah, let's just dive right into the financial terrorism of 2008. All right. Well, there was a a more complex setup for what was to happen in 2008 than what I described for the tech crash. Uh, that deflation and uh, you know driving the cap around and so forth was uh, relatively simple. But on uh, uh, on the tech crash, uh, we get to uh, a matter that uh, was uh, a little more intricate in the way it was set up. Uh, there were a number of things that uh, uh, going in to the 2003-2008 uh, uh, time period, you know, looking back at it, you remember that people said, oh my gracious, the Federal Reserve uh, inflated the money supply and uh, blew up the housing market and uh, caused a bubble and uh, uh, yes. so many people got loans that should never have had a loan to own a house and things of that sort. Well, <clears throat> in my estimation, that is not what happened at all. Uh, remember that uh, during those years, uh, just to get back to where uh, close to where we were and to a non-deflationary uh, dollar uh, that had uh, had set up that uh, tech crash, uh, we had to, we needed to get to uh, a three hundred and fifty dollar an ounce gold, and uh, it took some doing to do that, but uh, even in all of those years between two thousand. Uh, the end of the tech crash in 2002 and, uh, uh, and 2008, in that period that supposedly the Fed was accused of uh, just uh, uh, creating a bubble by blowing up the money supply, 
the most the Federal Reserve in any one year in that period added to the monetary base was $45 billion. And that might be a little on the high side. Uh, most of it was, most years were less than that. Uh, 2006 uh, was even negative, um, which again was at the point of setting up uh, uh, what was to come in, in 2008, uh, 2007 and 2008. Uh, but uh, let's talk about the other things that were put into place in order to get ready uh, for the uh, so-called subprime mortgage uh, uh, crash, mortgage crisis. Um, what happened along uh, with that, you know, very, it wasn't loose monetary policy at all uh, during those years. Uh, we had had the Bush tax cuts and we actually had gotten out of uh, the deep deflationary uh, recession that we'd had. And with those Bush tax cuts, we actually started growing and they needed to uh, provide more money. Um, uh, in the monetary base, but uh, as of uh, 2006, uh, the uh, the Fed started abiding by its one of its Keynesian principles uh, called the Phillips curve, and uh, uh, without being fancy about it, uh, what the Phillips curve amounts to is that if you want to fight inflation, uh, you put people out of work. I mean, it really is just as simple as that. Uh, and to do that, uh, you uh, destroy jobs, and you do that by raising interest rates. Were they worried about hyperinflation? Uh, <clears throat> they might say they are, uh, but uh, the inflation was not there. Yes, they had some... Uh, uh, housing um, uh, indications of, of high prices, particularly in places like uh, uh, California and some of the high price markets. Uh, but those uh, had, had other aspects. Uh, and the, uh, the gold price was still uh, very well in hand. It was had had a hard time of even getting above 350 or even to 350 an ounce. Uh, when it had been uh, 400 back at the time of the dollar stability, uh, relative stability and the recession in the early 90s. Uh, so uh, uh, that was, uh, again, when the gold price was still uh, relatively honest. But uh, in 2007, the interest rate policy and the Phillips curve uh, practices of the Federal Reserve actually put out of work intentionally about a uh, million people in in that regard, uh, in that range. And uh, obviously that gives you a nice start if you want to have a uh, mortgage crisis, that is uh, defaults on mortgage payments because when people lose their jobs, uh, they usually can't pay the mortgage. Now, uh, I've got to move back just a little bit and tell you what setup was done in other respects to get ready for the, uh, the, the 2008, 2007, 2008, uh, uh, crash, uh, before that. Um, okay. Uh, these factors were put into place. They, uh, Wall Street invented a new type of what's called a derivative, uh, called a credit default swap. And what it amounted to is, is a, uh, a contract uh, that you could buy in which uh, that credit default swap allowed you uh, to bet on whether a bond was going to default or not or whether a mortgage was going to default or not. And uh, uh, it was the equivalent, it's been said many times, that it's like allowing a person to buy uh, fire insurance on another person's home. And uh, when you do that, uh, you you start to have, we'll say, a real interest in whether that, uh, in uh, seeing that that home catches fire, if you have that kind of a contract that's going to pay you a lot of money if the house is... Because it's not yours. Uh, that's correct. 
So it allows outside bettors to bet on these bonds. Uh, that's an important aspect of things. Keep that one in mind. At the same time, there was a new index of mortgage-backed securities. Mortgages were being put into securities and uh, sold as mortgage-backed securities uh, through the financial markets of both uh, the U.S. and uh, Europe. A lot of foreign investors were going into this, and uh, they were designed in such a way as to uh, solidly be designed to uh, secure the mortgage uh, to the point of a AAA rating. Um, and some of these were subprime mortgages, what's called uh, mortgages that uh, aren't by themselves uh, subprime, but you could put enough extra mortgages in there that even with a uh, the maximum historic dis, uh, default rate, there would still be money of there, uh, plenty of money there to pay back the interest and uh, the principal on the bonds. And so that's the way they got the AAA rating. But uh, this new subprime mortgage index called the ABX was created in London. Uh, it was set up, as I recall, uh, a couple of the principal backers were Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, two of the big financial houses uh, of Wall Street. Uh, and uh, that had a very uh, strange uh, design for that mortgage index. It was supposed to reflect uh, the way the market is pricing subprime mortgage securities. And the way they designed that index uh, is they put something like uh, just a few bonds in it, about two dozen, something on the order of 24 bonds, and they named the bonds. You could identify which bonds are in it. Uh, and uh, it was a clear reality by that time that with those credit default swaps that I just mentioned, that you could make sure a bond goes down by buying a credit default swap on it. Because the way the credit default swap is hedged is it involves selling some of those bonds short. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it, uh, uh, it allowed those 24 bonds to be targeted by people who wanted the index to show a negative progression. And of course, from the time that ABX uh, index went, uh, went live, it basically, and that was uh, like March of 2007, uh, it started dropping like a rock. And, um, uh, and let me tell you, though, I've got another uh, amazing thing that just happened to congeal about the same time, 2007, um, 2000, it might have started in 2006, but I believe it's right at the beginning of 2007, an accounting rule was changed. It changed, uh, they changed an accounting rule at the AICPA, American Institute of uh, Certified Public Accountants. <clears throat> They adopted what's called a mark-to-market accounting rule for how you value these uh, bond investments that you got on your balance sheet uh, and went back to a rule that was repealed in 1938 because it had been concluded at that time it was so unsound and so un destabilizing to the markets. They put that mark to market back in uh, a rule back into play, and basically what it provided was that if uh, there is any indication that the value of the bonds on your balance sheet uh, are declining or changing in price, you've got to market to the market quarterly, and you have to run that change in value through your profit and loss statement as if it is cash loss, regardless of whether you have sold the bond or not. So can, for listeners, can you explain essentially what that ended up happening? Uh, it came down to the point that uh, uh, by manipulating that ABX index, as was easily done by uh, selling credit, uh, buying credit default swaps on uh, the bonds named in the index, 
They made the index go down. The accountants then immediately used the market, mark to market rule uh, and uh, adopted the ABX index as an indicator that those, those bonds on the balance sheets of investors that had invested on that uh, mortgage backed securities, uh, that the, the value of those securities were dropping like a rock. As soon as they started making those uh, investors mark them down to market, they started dropping those into the market, uh, selling them at market price. They dropped like a rock further. Uh, and uh, therefore, there was an absolute panic on the value of those securities. Uh, even before there was any indication, any substantial indication, that defaults were going up. Uh, the bonds were dumped. They were bought at, uh, at bargain basement prices. Uh, it was a so-called collapse of the mortgage market uh, because of the unsoundness of the, the, uh, uh, the mortgages that had been granted. Uh, but let me tell you a story that I, I tell briefly in my book, but it's an, another real indicator of what's going on. Uh, there was a piece written by uh, one of the Wall Street writers, that, a really good one, the, the one who uh, writes the books, uh, you know, The Big Short, and uh, yep. uh, really a, a terrific writer. He had a source, a hedge fund guy, who uh, complained to him. He says, <clears throat> uh, we're set to make a lot of money on this uh, – uh, we we got a plan to make a lot of money on this uh, uh, mortgage-backed security thing, but our problem is that we just can't find enough. I'll I'll clean it up uh, even more than uh, the writer did, Michael. Um, oh, well, oh, anyway, uh, and just call it. We can't find enough bad bond, bad uh, mortgages. We can't find enough bad bonds. Uh, and then later, he learned, the guy informed him, ah, we found a way to get them. The way they found, they, they wanted the bad bonds in order to be able to sell them into the market, you know, short them, uh, quite, uh, buy the credit defaults, all that, cause them to drop and, uh, and make, make money on the short side. Well, uh, the way they found to create a bad bond is number one, they could hire the mob or someone to make some just completely fraudulent loans. But the real uh, ticket that they found to having lots of bad loans was to buy credit default swaps on them, on the bad loan. And that basically, the way a credit default swap operates is it makes a mirror image of that bond. So you can buy a thousand credit default swaps on the same bad bond and you have a thousand bad loans. <laughs> and so they found the magic potion of using the credit default swaps to multiply the bad loans and they, multi they, they made entire mortgage-backed securities uh, that, uh, that was populated in terms of its assets entirely with bad loans. And that basically is the kind of thing that Goldman Sachs got finally um, sued about for allowing such a bond to be uh, sold through their processes when um, uh, the seller of the bond knew what it was and the buyer of the bond didn't. Well, the buyer of the bond was told it was AAA. Uh, yeah. And so – uh, and he did, so and the buyer, he, and he they lied to the, the buyer. Seller was selling it short and things of that sort. I, I've given all the details of that, uh, and uh, I, uh, I, I'm sorry, I have to take, uh, uh, I had to disconnect that. But that is uh, a, a short version of exactly how manipulated uh, that, uh, that whole mortgage bond crash was uh, and the attack on uh, various other aspects of the market were extremely fraudulent, extremely uh, critical. I can uh, move on from there. Uh, 
I, I think I've given you an idea of just how manipulated the whole thing was. There were many more good mortgages, including subprime mortgages and, and also subprime mortgage securities that were bought at pennies on the dollar. And uh, the ones who made the greatest profits, uh, the hedge funds that made the greatest profits after 2008 – during the, uh, uh, the next five years, were the ones who bought those fire sale mortgage-backed securities and let them go back up in value as they wound up uh, being fully performing uh, and not worthless at all. Uh, uh, so can, can you, you put, a, you have a lot of examples of some of the just horrible things that went on. For example, IndyMac seized despite $15 billion of cash of holding company and then just given to people. Could you talk about that? Uh, They're not just there. There's you have multiple examples, so maybe just a few of them. Well, uh, I, uh, you can go on and on. Uh, I mean, Lehman Brothers uh, basically uh, was killed because it uh, uh, got us, uh, the cash due to them from uh, uh, Goldman Sachs and Chase Manhattan. Uh, I'm, I can't I call it Chase Manhattan. I mean J.P. Morgan Chase. They basically just cut off the money that uh, they owed Lehman, uh, and Lehman uh, couldn't come up with enough cash, and uh, you know they were uh, they were executed. And so it was and an orch the, orchestrated Reserve, assassination. Pardon me. It was an orchestrated assassination. Yes, of uh, Lehman. Uh, they were a uh, an enemy, a, a, a competitor of Goldman Sachs, and uh, a lot of hard. Uh, our uh, feelings there and so forth. And so, uh, yes, uh, the IndyMac thing happened to be a bank uh, right there, you know, within a mile or two from uh, where I lived at the time. I didn't know the CEO, but I, I knew his executive assistant. And uh, they certainly appeared to be uh, on the up and up uh, entirely. Uh, there was not even a real threat uh, you know, their stock price was being at attacked, but in terms of their financial stability, uh, uh, rock solid. But uh, uh, Chuck Schumer helped uh, put a run on the bank and uh, increase uh, an attack on their, their stock price by writing a letter to the regulator saying that he's afraid this, this IndyMac is going to be uh, uh, failing and uh, by getting headlines, leaking that letter and uh, getting headlines, he got a few people around the block a little bit. And that gave the cover for the Fed to come in on a Friday evening, shut them down, take their assets and uh, basically pass them along to uh, three guys, two of them, Goldman Sachs, uh, former executives. And the third one was George Soros. Um, and uh, one of those three, by the way, uh, it's well known and it certainly came out uh, in the uh, confirmation hearings uh, under the Trump administration. The new Secretary of the Treasury was one of those three men, uh, Mr. Mnuchin. Uh, so uh, uh, they not only got, got that uh, big bank for essentially nothing, uh, as, uh, by the way, J.P. Morgan Chase got... Uh, Bear Stearns, uh, before that, uh, they got Bear Stearns as the first big casualty. Uh, they got uh, executed in the same more or less way that Lehman did. Uh, but uh, J.P. Morgan Chase got Bear Stearns essentially free. They ha wound up having to pay $2 a share uh, and uh, for something that had been 30 and 60 before they were under attack. And... Um, uh, and they not only got that, but they got uh, a total of $55 billion from the Fed to make sure they didn't have any uh, losses by their generosity in, oh, in uh, taking over this uh, uh, problem asset. Uh, so this is just crazy. Was, so, yeah. I mean, and then you look at the slight audit of the Fed and the trillions that went out. So can you give us, we have a couple of minutes here left. Can you give us, so much of this details is in your book. So people really need to buy your book. But can you just give us an overview, like a two-minute summary of what their 
agenda was? Because that crazy. Well, it was to uh, uh, make a great deal of money in these transactions. Again, I'll make the point that crashes are the most profitable time uh, ever for uh, the financial elite the, because they are on the short side and they make their money, their profits much faster than they do when you have a slow growing economy and you're riding it uh, up as you gradually year after year uh, plod along. They love the crashes. Uh, well, and that's where a the average person loses all their money. Uh, that's correct. So it's a big sucking sound from the average per or the middle class because the poor doesn't really use the stock market. Yeah. It's a big sucking sound from the middle class to the elite. Yeah, and the poor uh, suffer right along because they're the ones without the jobs. They're, yeah. they're the first ones to go. They're the ones that the, the, the Fed made sure got fired at the beginning of the mortgage thing. and did it on purpose, just as uh, clearly as, as could be. Those people who bought those houses... Uh, uh, fully deserved them. They had jobs. Uh, they they wanted them. They were working hard and so forth. There were some flat out frauds, but those were done by the mob, not by ordinary people, uh, by by any means. Uh, by well, there's large. always yeah, there's always, always criminals. exceptions. Always exceptions. Yeah. Yes, but uh, well, yeah. I can't thank you enough for the series that you've done, and I really want to tell people that. They need to go out there and get this your book to get all this information. It is just a wealth of knowledge. And can you tell people again where they can get it? Well, let me just say first, uh, number one, I owe you a great uh, debt of gratitude for having me. Uh, you're the one with the audience, and without your audience, I essentially wouldn't have one. So I'm very grateful. Now, in regard to uh, the book, I can tell you, it does a far better job on all of these matters than I can do orally from memory. Uh, it has uh, uh, so much more explanation and detail uh, and things that uh, I'm quite certain uh, are not available in any other single book. Um, if there had been, I can guarantee you I would not have used my time the way I have you know, for the last uh, 10 years and more. Uh, in this regard, but I'm very happy I did, and uh, I do uh, uh, thank you again and commend you for it, uh, that you have a, a wonderful audience, and uh, I think it will be uh, an indication of uh, better times in terms of people having uh, more information about this. Uh, my, my website is uh, classicalcapital.com. And it is possible to buy on that button, even though it says PayPal, you can use your credit card. If you buy on my uh, website, uh, I ship postage free. And uh, I mean, no shipping and handling cost. Uh, you have a small charge on uh, Amazon for that. Uh, Amazon also uh, has it. And so you can do that if you want. But uh, easy to find. It's also available in a, an ebook on Kindle on uh, uh, Amazon and uh, available in various countries. And you have an audience, by the way, certainly in, in many countries, and they've, they've been buyers, I'm uh, happy to say. Um, I, uh, I'm very grateful for uh, the chance to talk with you and to have a person who's actually really interested and knowing the ins and outs of these things, uh, and rather than saying there's just nothing we can do about it, uh, there is, and we have to, we need to. Uh, uh, I'm not sure whether I told you, maybe I did the last time, but it's worth repeating, that uh, uh, the big lie that uh, Franklin Roosevelt told in his first inaugural address was uh, that uh, most famous line of his from that address, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Uh, that was a uh, big lie in my opinion because the point of my book is, unfortunately, we do have a, uh, a menacing, deadly opponent uh, in the ruling elite. Uh, they are there with a shadow government uh, trying to do their best uh, to harm us and our families and our affairs, and we need to take that into account 
and act accordingly. Well, thank you so much. You can never do wrong with education. Thank you so much for having me, Sarah.